Welcome to Wilson's Wild Ride. Um, today we are in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the Gettysburg Battleground. Um, and today we have Mr. Jim Barrel with us as our guest. He's going to be kind of narrating um, what all took place here. Mr. Barrel here is a veteran and I believe you were what, on the Union side, Mr. Barrel? <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, sir, as long as they don't fool my social security. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we're gonna we're gonna take a ride through the Gettysburg battleground and uh, here we go okay what we're pointed at up there to the north you see that big monument up there that is considered the monument for the whole battlefield it's a major monument mainly because this is the day the first day's battle was hugely important as I said, John Buford's men were lined up along this ridge, pointing their cannon to the west, horse-drawn cannon, and uh, all these Union cavalrymen were lined up along this ridge. Here we're coming to Buford Avenue here. Which way we go? We go left. Left? Oh, God. And out there are the hills that hide Chambersburg, or beyond the mountains, hills. Anybody from Wyoming would tell you those aren't mountains. And uh, the rebel army came this way from the west, headed east to Gettysburg, and they're marching down, I guess it was called Chambersburg Pike then. It was Route 30 now, but at any rate, they came this way. And Buford, knowing they were coming, because he had some intelligence, a scout out, as we say, and uh, take a right. You have to. They came down and ran right into the line of Yankee cavalry, which started shooting at them, and the Confederates really were caught with their pants down, and they spread out side to side, as you have to do. You're marching single file, single column, into a line of artillery. You suddenly have to move to left and right, well, at that point, the artillery and the cavalry really shot them up. The cavalry, the Union cavalry, were carrying seven-shot Sharps rifles, repeaters. Nobody else had those in those days. Everybody else was carrying single-shot muskets, and they take a long time to reload, which I have done myself many times as a kid, and it takes a while. However, they were firing one ounce lead ball bullets called mini balls. French pronunciation would be minet. And that was a big lead bullet which weighed a lot and it was semi conical with the first streamlined shot used and devised. Used during the war, flew much better because it was streamlined. And also, it had a cone-shaped cutout in the base, sort of like an ice cream cone had been cut out of it. And so it expanded when you fired it, so it grabbed the rifling of the rifle. And this gave it spin, so they were much more accurate than any other kind of rifle. Do you want to go on up here? Yep. Yeah. Sure you do. Uh, because the ball expanded in the barrel, it grabbed the rifling and it got spin from the rifling. Uh, a spinning object is much more gyroscopically stable, so they are much more accurate weapons. The muskets were not accurate. The carbines, however, were much more accurate, and they also had seven shots. The artillery mounted up here that could fire onto the battlefield. You see the seminary cupola down there? Yep. That's going to be more important later. Anyhow, big battle on this field down to our right, called the North Field. Tremendous battle. Several famous stories happened in here. But the battle lasted all day into the afternoon, and the Union certainly had them stopped, but they were pouring in from Chambersburg, a whole army, uh, Lee's entire army except for the people who had gone north to Harrisburg and they had gotten the word come for Gettysburg in a hurry 
Can you imagine that? Marching all day, double time. Oh, anyhow, they were coming down from Harrisburg, having burned the bridge, and they got here just in time. They came in from here, the north side, and caught the Union Army in the flank. A lot of battle. This, the, the, the fighting swept north and south across this fire field all afternoon. <clears throat> Some famous things happened on this field. Uh, one officer saved some other officer's life, and they were both probably both from Ivy League schools, so they almost almost knew each other, or their families did. One guy saved the other guy life by giving him water or something. And 30 years later, they met at a party. It's are you general? Blah blah. Yes, I am, General Barlow. Oh, and 30 years later, after the battle, it's something to meet the guy who saved your life. At any rate, that happened, and a lot of other famous things. And it swept back and forth. But as Ewell's troops came down from the north, from Harrisburg, took the Union Army in the flank, which is disturbing whenever it happens, and so they retreated. At that point, the Union retreated to Gettysburg, where we will go next. And the famous, uh, we're back on. Off to the right, there was a lot of fighting in that field out there along Reynolds Avenue. The famous Union officer, General John Reynolds, who had been a superintendent at West Point, they thought that he was going to take over the Union Army after uh, Hooker got fired. Is that the seminary? You, you see the cupola up there? Yeah, there's the famous cupola. That's where Buford was standing, looking south, hoping that the Union Army was coming, who was commanded by General Reynolds. It was the first division, I guess. He, that was kind of tough filling you in for the uh, the movie goes into this very dramatic point part where he's standing up there searching to the south for the uh, Union Army coming up from Emmitsburg, which is just below my house there, where you can see it from my house. And he watched and he watched in a very dramatic part of the movie. And finally he saw them coming really just in time. General Reynolds rides up with his aides and his staff. He come, Mark runs up the stairs and said, John, what's happening? And John Buford says to General Reynolds, there's hell to pay, General. <laughs> and okay, go up, that's Sam Elliott talking. And they, they bring your army in at the double. First division came up this way from the south spread out into that field in a line and along around in front of us at Gettysburg down the road to the left spread out here and hid behind everything they could think of and went on into the town skirmishing now the Confederates were pretty tired by this time they fought all day no food and so they were they chased the Yan Yankees through Gettysburg a lot of the Yankees hid in Gettysburg Several of them got killed, and a, a famous episode where a general or a high-ranking officer hid in a pigsty in Gettysburg until the battle was over, and the loyal family fed him, but then it quieted down for the night. The Union Army went through Gettysburg, up the hill, to Cemetery Ridge. Now this is Confederate Avenue. The Confederates in the second day lined up along where we're gonna drive down their line of entrenchments and encampments and everywhere they were. I don't think it's become one way yet. And you'll see this line of cannons set up. This is where it begins. The Confederates were all in the woods here and along this line, they had their artillery pointing that way, which is east. And the Union 
army was all in Gettys and up on the other side of Gettysburg, up on that ridge over there to the left, which is known as Cemetery Ridge. And very confusing. This ridge we're on is called Seminary Ridge. <laughs> and all these batteries, these were the battle. The battalions, the artillery was famous battalions were placed firing that way toward the town and the Union was in the town and all lining up and camped out along Cemetery Ridge that night and you could tell where they were by the campfires. Everybody used all the wood they could find which is frequently farmers fences which irritated the farmers. Good thing not to have a war cover your property Anyhow, there were no fences. They did tore up everything to burn, to cook their sow belly and their bacon, boil their coffee. And uh, this is going to go on for several miles. No, that's... Imagine how tired you get. Sweating all day, no water. So the Union soldiers are sitting up on top of there, and the Confederate soldiers went half dead dragging up the side of that hill to try to get to their enemy and they're and they're down there shooting down okay. there's a wonderful statue up there of a guy named governor warren surveyor and he came down here and saw the battlefield kind of all by himself but with a courier or two with him alone and saw what was going to happen if the yankees didn't occupy that ridge and he said he intercepted some people right here, I think it was 20th Maine, and sent them up here to the top of Little Round Top, and his name was Colonel Strong Vincent, a 22-year-old colonel. He had gone to Harvard, and any of it's a big part of the movie, and he put the 20th Maine up there. He himself placed them, because he could see what was going to happen, and he put them there as a blockage so that the Confederates couldn't get anybody cannon up there and enfilade the whole battlefield. So here's another save the day action on the part of a very young colonel. Wow. And, uh, well, he did it. Of course, he got killed that very afternoon. But there's monuments up there, statues for him. But Governor Warren's the surveyor saw way ahead of time it's what was going to happen they went back and told general meade look this is bad down here he Meade said, take some men and get down there and cut them off stop her the bottle which he did and sickles the guy who went that way uh should not have and uh he went that way and got shot got his leg shot off and his his leg is now preserved and in the Smithsonian. <coughs> Nothing much left but a bone. Right. Say General Sickles, who became a senator. Oh wow. Political general. Wow. He frequently visited his leg and <laughs> they say. Oh that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Soldiers. Yeah. Sold Confederate soldiers hid all over the place and played hell with the Yankees, firing from this natural cover. You could hide behind anything. But there's a famous picture of a Confederate sharpshooter lying down dead behind his pile of rocks in one of these crevices. He was picking Yankees off all day from up here in this, well, what wonderful natural cover, right? Yeah, Probably right up there to our right. So they came in here from the west, infiltrated in here, and took cover here, and were picking off Yankees all day long. You can see what kind of a view of Little Round Top you've oh, got from yeah. here. Oh yeah, that's excellent. And they did have artillery here. You could pick them off, and they did pick off uh, Colonel Vincent and a lot of other people. Joshua Chamberlain, 20th Maine, the famous colonel, had his troops up there stood off the Confederates who were coming across trying to take the hill. The end of the Union line was right here and Joshua Chamberlain's 
Brigade Corps was anchoring it. They were the end of the line, which is a big deal in the movie, and it was a big deal. But you can see they had big rocks to hide behind, which was fortunate because Confederates were coming at them a whole lot of them from that direction. And the Yankees, the Union, stood up here and fought them off, charge after charge, time after time, maybe up to seven times. And in the end, the Yankees ran out of ammunition. Said, Colonel, we haven't got any more ammunition. Got no powder, no ball. What are we going to do? And Chamberlain made himself into a hero. At that moment, he ordered bayonet. And they, it swept up and down the line like wildfire, put on the bayonets, and they fixed bayonets and charged downhill at the oncoming Confederates who were really, really tired and out of water and had marched all day with no water. That's a famous, famous part of the battle. Chamberlain's men charged the Confederates and stopped them in their tracks. We're rolling. This is, theoretically, this was the high water mark of the Confederacy. The charge, Pickett's charge, was stopped here. A lot of guys behind stone walls, which gives you quite an advantage. And I was saying earlier about the mini ball, it was a soft lead, 58 caliber, which would be considered a cannon now. And when it hit something solid, it's mushroomed. Well, that's very bad for your arm, the bones in an arm or leg. And so it would shatter the bone. That's why they amputated everything, not because they were stupid and didn't know better, because you can't do anything with a shattered arm when you've got a thousand more to do that afternoon. So of course the amputation is the only way to save it. Cut it off, leave a flap of skin to sew over it, and you've got a clean amputation, if you were lucky. They didn't know anything about sterilization in those days. They'd drop their scalpel on the floor and wipe it off on their muddy sleeve. Nevertheless, people lived through it 